Hello everyone, and building on last week's readings and comments on situated learning and communities of practice, Jill and I are going to set up the discussions for this coming week. These centre around subjects and ways of thinking and practising within these. We've opted for a debate format to present our thinking on the two core readings and hopefully then everyone else will join in the debate. The statement uh, we're going with is this house believes that creating a community of practice is possible across subject areas and I'm first up giving the affirmative argument. So I propose that ways of thinking and practicing or participating in a community of practice is transferable across subjects despite the underlying knowledge and practical skills differing. Using the Anderson and Hounsell paper, Knowledge Practice is doing the subject in undergraduate teaching, I will provide some evidence for my argument. The paper is one output from the long-running Enhancing Teaching Learning Environments project and discusses research findings from two different subject areas in an undergraduate environment. So I put forward that this paper, the two different subjects are history and biology and that the students see the value of having ways of thinking and practising that go beyond knowledge transfer. That is, each subject has a different list of actual ways of thinking and practising, yet share the overarching forms of understanding and skills, but also values and orientations towards knowledge. They are all learning to think like a professional. This includes reflecting, questioning and being critical. So I've got two quotations. The first is, I think they're trying to make us think more about what we are doing and I think that's probably the most important thing that they're trying to get us to do. Then a second quotation, you're always questioning things rather like a lawyer. So you question why did they write that? So without reading the paper, I think that it would be difficult to guess which subject student to put to each of these quotations as they are very subject neutral. So the first was actually the biology student and the second was the history student. Rather than being subject specific, the success of ways of thinking and practice is down to course design and teaching staff fostering the practices within authentic, dynamic, safe environments. And at this point, I will hand over to Jill. Thank you, Claire. And uh, hello to everybody. In order to put the negative side for this debate, I want to focus on practice. I think what Claire's um, talked us through and explained works really well in theory. But in practice, I think communities uh, need to be subject orientated or experience orientated. In other words, demonstrate the value of the situated learning. So if we start with the story of the text in the foundry, which is the, the core part of the second reading for this week in that paper, we find that we have two very separate communities with a lot of knowledge and a lot of experience. But actually, despite um, the author's attempt at explaining this, this boundary practice where these two communities have an opportunity to come together share knowledge and experience in order to introduce a completely new process, uh, a digital way of working, those two communities fall back on very established power relations. So they don't come together well, they don't integrate, the knowledge doesn't transfer well across those two groups. And I think that really, that it really resonated with me in terms of my own experience. Um, I found myself quite outraged on behalf of the autoclave workers when I was reading the paper and I was particularly interested in the information that wasn't in the paper. So based on many years of working in organisations and in HR and L&D functions, you know, what on earth was going on in terms of the way that this new process has been um, introduced? Um, why wasn't there more support for those groups? Were HR colleagues um, then overwhelmed with the uh, fallout from, from how this was managed? So, so really interesting in, in how that paper sets up a lot more thinking, but the, you know, the, which it doesn't provide the evidence for any of that. But what we do get 
is a clear sense that those two knowledge communities are separate, they remain separate, and they do not transfer um, knowledge across well. Uh, apart from one person who becomes the broker, as in um, Wenger's description, um, it really does not um, offer a, a positive experience for those two groups. In terms of um, useful quotations from that second paper, I think understanding what they mean by the boundary practice, which is a temporary encounter between members of two different practices, each grounded in their own economy of meaning. And in, in the boundary practice that they're describing, there are learning projects for both communities. But as we see, that doesn't really come to fruition. So it'll be really interesting to see what the group can be managed better and whether through the management and learning design that Claire's mentioned, it would be possible to bring those two communities together as, as a whole. My feeling is that actually a completely separate piece of work needs to be done and that those two knowledge communities will always be separate. Claire, any thoughts following that? Yes, I think really it's agreeing with you and taking a bit of what I said as well in that I don't think the community of practice can sit in isolation outside of the thought of the design. So whether that design is in the workplace or in the university or school setting, that someone has to have it thought out first. So I, th I think it just can't, well, maybe in some circumstances, but in general, I don't think you can leave it to just assume that it will happen naturally. Mm, I think that's um, a really good point. And something that I was interested in in, in one of the papers from week four um, by Andrew Northage was the, the challenge that people are faced when they enter a new knowledge community, even when they have a right to be there and they absolutely belong there. So whether that's a, a university student you know, starting their, their journey and belonging to that subject community, as, as described in the paper you looked at, or groups that I work with tend to be groups of professionals that come together around a particular discipline or, or piece of work. Within that community, there are still challenges around the language, because those communities have their own language, which is obscure to others. Um, there will be experts within that community, so there is power through knowledge uh, and expertise and experience, and, and, and new people have to find their way with that and find their voice critically. And I thought that was fascinating from week four, and I've certainly been using some of that thinking with a, with a group this week. So there's already enough of a challenge, I think, for people to establish themselves in their own knowledge community by subject or profession or, or experience. And so to bring two communities together, it may well be possible, but I think it needs a lot more work and it certainly won't happen organically. And there was a paper in the introductory module, and I don't know whether you call it Idle or idle. I heard it called, <laughs> I heard it called both of those. I quite like idle simply because of the irony of yes. um, a G credit module in, in one semester being idle, but um, it's anything but. But the, uh, the paper in, in that module by Jen Ross and Sean Bain, one of the early ones, where they describe the real challenge for academics when they were expected to move from a traditional way of working where they were presenting lectures and working with students in that way to working in a, a digital environment and the sort of the rise of the learning technologies within all of that. If universities struggle with those different knowledge communities to bring them together, then a, a manufacturing um, business you know, is certainly going to struggle. Absolutely, and as one of those learning technologists, th those <laughs> chal those challenges are there every day. And uh, you know, are we just trying to load more things onto the plate? Is it just another one for the list? So instead of seeing it and digital as potential solutions, it just becomes yet another burden. So it's another block to the community as opposed to actually a step up or a help. So. Yes, so I think that paper of Jen Ross's and the ones we've been reading, I think we need to look to the digital, 
but in that human sense that that's always the block is trying to get that it's not taking the human away it's not losing it's it's a gain so that's where i think the difficulties lie in that respect community is only ever going to be a community with people and the digital is only ever going to be able to facilitate that process but it can never replicate and I suppose um, everybody needs to understand up front the huge benefits to be had through those communities, but those benefits are really only realised through participation. So it's a bit like this programme here, isn't it, that we're in, that the greater the participation, the greater the benefit to all of us. And I, and I guess there's some tension in that with being you know, students working in this way and also having you know, busy lives and, and everything as well just interesting to reflect on on how actually we're in that at the moment yes we're well we're i suppose we're not we're now building our own community of practice in it in another yeah. sense aren't we yeah yeah exactly that i think when you read the papers it you know it seems completely feasible and um quite idealistic in, in some ways but but actually there's a lot of hard work um, that needs to go on to build communities. Certainly I've found that within my own online courses that you need to be active in there. Yes, I, I certainly agree with that. So what do you think, Joe? Will we hand over at this point to everyone else? Oh, I think so, yeah. See you all in the space this week.